If this is your first NPF event, you should know that we are a nonprofit. Our mission is to help journalists understand complicated topics, and that's why we're here today to talk about this complicated topic of the Federal Reserve. Today's program is a partnership with the Milken Institute, and we are very grateful for their financial support and their topical expertise. In a minute, I'll introduce Stacy Warden, who's going to be helping moderate today. Um, although with these experts, we're not going to need any moderating, right? Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> um, I want to introduce them. I'm going to start with Robin. Uh, in the middle, Robin Harding is the U.S. Economics Editor for the Financial Times. Uh, he covers the U.S. Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury. Previously, he was the Tokyo correspondent for the FT, and before that, <clears throat> uh, he covered the Bank of Japan. Uh, pretty interesting. And also interesting, before entering journalism, Robin worked in asset management and as a public policy researcher at the Social Market Foundation. Um, so thank you for being here today. Uh, Komal, Sri Kumar, now how, which, how should we? Uh, Sri would Shri. be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a senior fellow at the Milken Institute and also president of his own consulting firm, uh, Sri Kumar Global Strategies, which advises multinational firms and sovereign wealth funds. Uh, he previously was um, the chief global strategist for the Trust Company of the West, among other positions there. He's been a senior vice president at Drexel Burnham. Um, articles and interviews have been published all over the place, including in the Financial Times and uh, many other uh, outlets. And uh, Shri, we're very happy to have you here today. Uh, John Faust is special advisor to the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Um, he's currently on leave from Johns Hopkins, where he's professor of economics and also director of the Center for Financial Economics. Uh, he's been there since 2006, and prior to that, spent two decades uh, at the Federal Reserve, uh, including the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Um, he is a researcher. His topics include forecasting and modeling the effects of monetary policy. So he's an important additional voice today. And finally, Jim Glassman, who's the managing director and senior economist of J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. He helps clients understand what's happening in this economy, and I hope he's going to help us understand it a little bit this morning. He also watches the research uh, that shapes the economy and financial markets. He's regularly cited in the financial media, regular commentator on economic policy issues. He previously served as a senior economist at the Federal Reserve Board uh, in Washington, D.C., and we thank him for being here. I'm going to turn you over now to Stacy Warden. She's executive director of the Center for Financial Markets at Milken. Previously, she spent six years with J.P. Morgan in London and two years in New York as part of the Sovereign Debt Restructuring Deal team. She's been a director at NASDAQ, has worked in international economic development at the U.S. Treasury, the Center for Global Development, and elsewhere. She'll be lightly moderating our sessions today, and we're very happy to share her expertise. Thanks, Stacy. So what I want to talk about in terms of the broad kind of story arc of this morning would be about, you know, how the Fed makes monetary policy in general, the impact of the Fed, oh, the Fed's quantitative, what is quantitative easing, how did it come about, you know, what is, what is, how is it different from the normal uh, way of making monetary policy, what are the impacts on the market, what have been the impacts on the market, and that's both the real economy and the financial markets. And then to kind of take a global perspective, compare the Fed to the Bank of England, to the ECB, and how are these regimes different? And then to talk about tapering. What does it mean? How will, how will it be constructed if it goes forward? What is this forward guidance we keep hearing about? And then what do we think the impacts will be? So that's kind of just broadly speaking the kind of the storyline of, of the morning. So John, with no further ado. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. I wanted to start out by noting that, that uh, uh, not too many years ago, uh, I wouldn't have been allowed to be here. In fact, nobody from a central bank would have been here. Montague Norman, the governor of the Bank of England uh, in the interwar years, uh, his motto was said to be, uh, never, never explain, never excuse. Uh, and that was kind of the philosophy of central banks uh, for many, many years. Uh, they tried their best not to explain themselves. And that's really changed remarkably. In 2012, the Federal Reserve uh, 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 first uh, promulgated a consensus statement of longer-run strategy and goals, 
And that started with the following statement. Uh, the committee seeks to explain its monetary policy decisions to the public as clearly as possible. Uh, such clarity facilitates well-informed decision-making by households and businesses, reduces economic and financial uncertainty, increases the effectiveness of policy, and enhances transparency and accountability, which are good things in the democracy. So, so the, the, uh, the world has completely changed about the role of communication in, in, uh, in central banking. The thought used to be that secrecy made policy better, and the thought now is policy works best if, if folks understand what you're trying to do. Um, so uh, with that background, I'm going to try and uh, explain the basics of monetary policy and kind of kick off this overall discussion. Uh, so let's start just with some generalities about central banks. Uh, so almost all nations have a central bank. In the U.S., we call it the Federal Reserve System. The, in the U.K., the Bank of England. Uh, the nations that share this currency we call the euro uh, have a central bank called the European Central Bank that works in conjunction with national central banks uh, in all the countries that share that currency. Um, now, central banks have a couple of main responsibilities, and they have since the uh, evolution of uh, modern central banking uh, in the last century and coming into, uh, or two centuries ago now, and coming into the uh, early 1900s. The first is monetary policy. Uh, that's the topic today. Monetary policy, uh, if you were to give one little thumbnail of what it's about, it's uh, the central bank uh, attempts to foster financial conditions uh, that promote uh, stable spending, stable growth, stable prices, uh, and general stability. Uh, the second traditional function of central banks, which is really where central banks got their start, is financial stability. And uh, before central banking, there were regular financial panics uh, that, that happened every, uh, every 10 years or so in many economies. And central banks were created to calm financial panics. And the main way they calm financial panics is by uh, standing ready to be a, what's called a lender of last resort to the financial institutions, which back then were all banks. Uh, and so uh, when a bank run might start, the central bank was ready to lend to the banks so that they could pay off the depositors and that, uh, uh, and that helped calm financial panics. So those are sort of the two defining features of, uh, of what a central bank does. Today we're talking about monetary policy, but as it turns out, these great innovations we had as of 1920 uh, uh, didn't quite stop financial crises and panics, and we had one recently. And so financial stability and monetary policy are more intertwined right now than, than they might be in, in, the, in, uh, in a long run of a quieter, more normal period. So other responsibilities vary across central banks. Many central banks around the world do lots of other things involved with the payment system and et cetera, but I won't get into those today. So let me uh, next talk a little bit about governance and independence. How do central banks uh, uh, run their business, uh, make their decisions? Uh, so around the world, monetary policy is generally made by a board. So the central bank has a board that makes decisions. And that board is generally appointed by the government, but the government isn't in a position to tell the board what to do. In other words, monetary policy decisions are independent of short-run political influences. Now, in a democracy, you have to have accountability, so they're appointed by the government, and the government may choose the goals the central bank is supposed to pursue, but they, don't, uh, they, don't, they can't dictate or overrule uh, uh, policy decisions. Now you might ask uh, how that peculiar uh, th how that peculiar result would would obtain. Um, central banks all over the world uh, generally uh, are independent, and the reason for this is that up to up to uh, before independence, there was a long history of uh, periodically in times of stress, the government uh, making really bad monetary policy, uh, and in particular, really bad monetary policy oftentimes uh, had a tendency to be uh, 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 printing lots of uh, printing lots of cash, generating lots of inflation, and uh, and so that's how this institution uh, or this uh, th this principle that central banks should be independent sort of evolved out of this long history worldwide of, of, of problems when uh, uh, when uh, the short term thinking that sometimes dominates politics uh, uh, comes to to uh, determine uh, monetary policy. Um, so the Fed Reserve in specific was uh, created by Congress about 100 years ago, just celebrated our, uh, our 100th year. 
and uh, it was modified in some important ways through the years, but we don't need to get into those details. Uh, the Federal Open Market Committee is an entity of the Fed that makes the monetary policy decisions. Uh, that's made up of 19 members, uh, so it's a 19-member board, seven governors of the Federal Reserve System, and among those governors are the, the, the chair, that's currently Chairman Bernanke and, and uh, soon to be Chairman, uh, Chairman Yellen. Uh, and uh, so there's seven governors, two of which are the chair and vice chair. And then there's uh, 12 presidents of the regional Federal Reserve Banks. So the Fed is a little unique in that it has uh, regional banks uh, uh, distributed around the country to have regional representation. And those presidents are also on the, uh, on the FOMC. Now, the governors are uh, appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, so standard political appointments. The presidents of the feds are chosen by the regional uh, banks and uh, with, with some supervision by the uh, Federal Reserve Board. And that was uh, what Congress thought was the right idea to get a mix between political influence and to insulate the Fed from political influence. And those decisions were made back when the Fed was founded, and, and that system is, has been the one we've been working with uh, ever since. So the FOMC has, meets eight times a year in regularly scheduled meetings. If they need to, they meet any other time. Uh, they decide on what change, if any, is warranted in, uh, in the stance of monetary policy, which is what I'm going to turn to in a moment. And importantly, the policy is set by a vote of uh, seven governors and five presidents, five of the 12 presidents. So five of all 12 presidents vote on a rotating basis. And that changes in January, so if you're following the press, you'll, you'll see that at the January FOMC meeting, uh, uh, some presidents will rotate off the voting responsibility and some presidents will rotate on. And then that always generates an opportunity for uh, the press to speculate about what that will mean and how, how do the uh, people who stopped voting, how do they differ from the ones who started voting. And, uh, uh, and, and, and there is sometimes a bit of a story there, but in general, this is a large committee that tends to, uh, tends to be fairly consistent in its decision making through the years. Um, so let me uh, turn next to, uh, uh, so they make decisions. Transparency is where I started today, that central banks try and explain their decisions. Uh, so modern thinking says that's a good idea, explain what you're trying to, trying to achieve. And transparency has been a trend with central banks all over the world. Uh, so most central banks are now much more transparent than they would have been uh, uh, some years ago. Uh, but this is still a work in progress. The uh, central banks all over the world are still uh, thinking, trying to think up better ways to communicate. And this is where uh, uh, you all can help us uh, when when uh, there's when there's uh, various of the, uh, the various of the ways we communicate that I'm going to enumerate in a minute. Uh, uh, where we could add, where we could clarify, uh, because it is our goal to be as clear as possible, uh, and uh, uh, love uh, love to have help on this uh, this work in progress. Um, it, ha it has come a long way. Let me just tell a quick anecdote. Andrew Crockett used to tell about the Bank of England that the Bank of England would typically refer to the markets as like they, you know, it's like us versus them kind of thing, mm -hmm. and the press would stand around outside the Bank of England and watch the tire level of the trucks going in and out to see if they had bullion or not at the level of the tires so that they could kind of try to take these educated guesses about what the Bank of England was up to because it was completely opaque. Yeah, one, 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 uh, one thing that I thought might come up in, 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 the, in the questions, but I think that this, uh, this, this story about the tires sort of uh, uh, highlights it, is uh, if, you, if you followed the press, uh, recently there was a conference at the IMF uh, in order of, in honor of uh, Stanley Fisher, who may be appointed as the vice chairman. But in any case, two of the senior researchers at the Federal Reserve Board had papers because uh, Stanley Fisher had been their advisor in graduate school, and so they wrote papers. And uh, uh, a number of outsiders uh, noticed that there were two papers by senior researchers at the Fed and thought that this must be like uh, the tires being low on the truck, must be a major signal of policy. Uh, uh, because in the, in the old days, there was all sorts of tea leaf reading and, and signaling and no clear communication. Uh, 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 because we're sort of used to the fact that that's not how we're trying to communicate now. We found this uh, uh, baffling. Uh, two guys went to give papers in honor of their uh, graduate advisor in graduate school, and that was the story. Uh, uh, 
And I think a lesson that uh, that that uh, that uh, we need to learn is that is, uh, that a lot of the a lot of the press and the public may still be in the mode of reading tea leaves, and we're, we're trying not to communicate through tea leaves. Uh, and I think uh, uh, you're you're right to be skeptical about that in the press, but you might consider the possibility uh, when somebody comes up with a, a story like uh, like this one about these two papers. Uh, that that's not the way we choose to signal a major change in policy. It's not the you know the order of the generals on top of Lenin's tomb in the in the Kremlin. Uh, we try and sort of uh, explain it. Um, uh, so transparency though is still a work in progress, and uh, m maybe maybe Robin will uh, will give us a uh, report card later. Uh, um, so the main communication vehicles are an FOMC statement after each of these eight meetings. The FOMC releases a statement that explains what's happening. Uh, the chair gives a press conference after four of these eight meetings a year, about quarterly. Uh, minutes of the FOMC meeting are released about three weeks later, and they kind of summarize the stuff that was said at the meeting. Uh, after five years, uh, there's a full transcript of the meeting release. And Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Can I ask you, so when you're talking about this transparency in the news conference and everything, so Ben Bernanke had his last news conference uh, in December um, as chair, and that was part of his transparency push, right? Because there never were press conferences right. before. So when, when you're talking about the transparency and, and, and that being increased in the last couple of years, and, and when you say the press shouldn't be reading tea leaves, um, so when he says... We should be shifting modes because we're right. trying to abandon one and get to the other, and it's not done yet. So that, no, I, I mean, I, I think the news conferences are a huge step. You know, obviously for someone trying to un understand it, to have the chair out there doing news conferences is great. But when he says, for example, one of the mm -hmm. questions in the news conference was about, um, can we expect this, um, the 10 billion, the, the start of the tapering, to be consistent with the new chair and everything. But if, if the members of the FOMC change, and you're gonna have five new members, if he's saying, trying to be transparent on the one side, saying we're gonna be consistent with this tapering, but on the other side, you have five of the 12 members changing. That seems contradictory to me. Well, first of all, it, it, mm. all five don't change because there's, uh, you know, you've got 12 and you're picking some and they don't all just go on and off. But, all but that doesn't be right, right, right. Oh. But, but, uh, uh, the, um, but let, me, um, uh, let me also say that there is, uh, you know, a bit of a conflict mm. Uh, between uh, in in any democracy, you think of foreign policy and the, and the president. You know, the, the president makes foreign policy statements that need to be uh, need to be persistent, and yet uh, and yet the party changes. And there's just a tension there in a in a democracy where we have leadership that turns over. And there is there is a tendency uh, now. What uh, what the what the chairman uh, what the chairman said in response to that uh, question, I believe, was first of all that that uh, uh, Vice Chair Yellen was fully on board with this, uh, but also both uh, both the chairman and the vice chairman have, have several times answered that all 19 members are involved in the conversation uh, at the FOMC, and when they when they attempt to make uh, policy decisions that are intended to be very persistent, in other words span uh, the time when there'll be some turnover, uh, they, they really look for uh, policies that have a broad, uh, broad support and that uh, are likely to be continued, uh, uh, are likely to be continued so long as, uh, you know, the economy plays out broadly as uh, anticipated. But there, is, but there is a tension there, just like there is, say, in foreign policy and, 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 the, and the president turning over. Um, uh, Thank you. Hey, John? Yeah. Quick follow-up. Do we know if Chairman Yellen is going to continue the press conferences? Is that a given? Uh, I don't. I don't think there's been any announcement on it. But yeah, the president. Yes, that, 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 the intention is to continue. Yeah. You can put yeah. in a plug for. No, that, that'd, be, that'd be news if if uh, that'd be a decision that would be would be announced. I and there's no. She's expressed commitment to the transparency. Oh yeah, she's. Uh, but both of them have uh, throughout their careers before being at the Fed and and while they've been at the Fed been. Uh, big supporters and committed to transparency, and you know that's not uh, you know it's a it's it's a pain, but it's the right thing to do. That's not the attitude. The reason that they're such big supporters is that uh, they really believe that policy is more effective if people understand what you're doing, and and so uh, that's a reason to think that that uh, uh, that the way the Fed achieves transparency will evolve, uh, b but the goal of, of um, uh, of making policy well understood uh, is pretty is pretty sound. 
uh, you know, it's really remarkable that in 1950, people didn't uh, generally subscribe to that uh, view, but they uh, they didn't, and now they do. Is it fair to say that the chairman's views are essentially the dominant ones? Mm. And, and isn't it a strong chair, one that can carry all the other votes along with their view? Well, through the years, that's 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 varied a good deal. Like on on any committee. Uh, and uh, the way the chairman might uh, carry that influence could be by being uh, generally thought to be the most astute one on the topic. Uh, during the crisis, you know, uh, Chairman Bernanke, you know, had made a lifelong study of such issues. And uh, I think his views carried a lot of weight because, uh, you know, he had some real uh, insights. Uh, so one way the chair uh, uh, carries this influence is by, you know, Weight of stature. By stature. Uh, and then, uh, then as in any committee, uh, 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 you know, people who have good ideas, uh, you know, have somewhat greater influence. Uh, but there is an open discussion. Uh, uh, uh. Now, historically, some chairmen were very autocratic. Uh, and uh, Chairman Bernanke made an effort uh, uh, at opening up the FOMC to have, uh, to get more input uh, than had been, so to be less autocratic. Uh, and uh, uh, Chairman, uh, Vice, Vice Chair Yellen, who will be Chair, Chair Yellen, uh, has uh, uh, said that she, ex she believes in that as well, that, 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 that general sense that, that it shouldn't be uh, an autocratic decision. Uh, but that will evolve through the years. Uh, you know, if, uh, if some autocratic chairman came in who wanted to be autocratic, uh, what success they'd have given the uh, given you know the recent tradition you know that's a matter of internal uh, committee dynamics like on any uh, committee. I think Summers would have been more autocratic than Yellen. I won't, I won't speculate <laughs> on that. <laughs> Every, <laughs> um, so so uh, uh, so those are the main vehicles. Uh, there's a few others. I'm going to skip some of this. Uh, I I think that these slides may be worth looking at, but I put in more than I intended to talk about, and especially if we have some good questions. The goal of all this communication is to explain the state of policy, to give a rationale for that policy, and very importantly, as we'll talk about much more later, to explain the likely future evolution of policy. Where, where's policy headed? So that, uh, that, that households and, and firms and all private sector decision makers, you know, just have a sense of what's, what's coming. Um, so monetary policy. Let's talk uh, quickly about the mandate. Uh, uh, that's given by Congress to the Fed. That's to promote maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. Uh, let me let me talk about the bits here a little bit, uh, because that's that uh, terms like maximum employment and stable prices are a little bit vague, and you might not know exactly what that means. Uh, moderate long-term interest rates, that that as well. So in, in 2012, as part of this general uh, move toward transparency, the FOMC adopted a consensus statement on longer run goals and strategy. The purpose of that was to explain how the Fed thought about those, that, uh, that mandate, which is, is sort of uh, clear in a certain sense about what the goals are, but, but uh, leaves a lot to be filled out. And so, uh, so first of all, you might ask the question, why was it a statement of longer run goals and strategy? And the, and the statement itself says that inflation, employment, and long-term interest rates, they fluctuate over time in response to economic and financial disturbances. Uh, monetary policy actions tend to influence these things with a lag. Uh, therefore, the committee's policy decisions reflect longer run goals. Policy is always directed at, at uh, pushing, pushing these variables to where we'd like them to be in the, in the, in the longer run. Not because uh, uh, we're, 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 we're patient and foolish about it, but because we, we can't do any better, that the economy will fluctuate and the best we can do is sort of push, uh, push things toward where we'd like them to be. So stable prices, does that mean zero inflation? Well, no, as you, as you know, the consensus statement sets a goal of 2% inflation measured a particular way through the, through the uh, favored index of the committee uh, right now. Um, uh, so why not zero inflation? Well, a long history, again, worldwide suggests that deflation, that is falling prices or negative inflation, that it's very bad for employment and growth. When economies experience falling, the falling general price level, 
uh, they perform very badly. Uh, so uh, if you aim at zero, you, you figure you're going to be below zero a bit and above zero a bit, and the below zero side is really quite scary. So 2% uh, was judged to be low enough not to be onerous, not to be costly inflation, but high enough to provide a bit of a cushion so that you don't fall into deflation. Maximum employment, you know, does that mean we like an unemployment rate of zero? Well, the consensus statement says that, uh, 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 that, that what, what the Fed will aim at is, or the FOMC will aim at is maximum sustainable employment. Uh, uh, an unemployment rate of zero is not viewed to be sustainable. So why is that? Well, in a dynamic economy, there's always some unemployment because in a dynamic economy, some firms go out of business, others are started. It takes a while to get out of one job and into another. So there's lots of reasons why folks might change jobs, people might move, uh, have to move, and when they do, they have to look for a new job. There's lots of good reasons why there'd be some unemployment. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, the Fed aims at what's viewed as uh, uh, a maximum sustainable rate of inflation. And uh, right now, that's, that number isn't known with precision, uh, but the FOMC uh, reports it in its uh, summary of economic projections. And right now it says it's probably in the 5.2 to 6.0% range on unemployment. Uh, so we've been well above that for a long time since 2009 when, when the unemployment rose in the crisis. Uh, so what about moderate long-term interest rates, the third part of the mandate? Well, that gets dropped a lot, and people talk about the dual mandate, and that's because the best way to get moderate long-term interest rates is to have stable prices and maximum employment, so it's viewed as uh, a, bit, a bit redundant. Uh, so how do central banks promote this goal? We're finally getting to the making of, of, of policy. Uh, so in conventional policy, what happens is that the central bank can control the interest rate at which banks lend to each other overnight for one day. At the end of the day, they borrow some money from another bank, pay it back the next day. Uh, that's called an overnight interest rate, and in different countries that overnight interest rate has a different name. In the U.S. it's called the federal funds rate. So that's an interest rate that banks borrow from each other for, for overnight. Uh, now you might think it's pretty weird that the Fed, uh, the main way in normal times that would control the economy is uh, is by affecting the interest rate on overnight loans between banks. Uh, as it turns out, uh, raising or lowering this federal funds rate, uh, the Fed sets a target, uh, that indirectly affects all other interest rates in the economy. And even more than interest rates, it affects stock prices and house prices and the exchange value of the dollar, as we, as we may hear about when we think of the implications on other countries. And John, John, maybe why don't you tell us why are banks borrowing money overnight from each other? What were they? Why, yeah, why were, yeah, why so, were they? Why, what, what's the so, so, uh, so in, in normal times, uh, uh, banks may borrow money from each other because uh, uh, the simplest story would be uh, I'm a bank and uh, I, I expect a certain level of, say, deposit outflow in a day, a bunch of people coming in and, and withdrawing money, either by writing checks or, or going to the teller window. Um, so I keep on hand some reserves so that I can pay those folks. But on a given day, uh, maybe more folks come in and take out money than I expected. Uh, so I go borrow some reserves from another bank. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's, that's the basic story. And if, uh, and if the central bank, uh, 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 the central bank affects the interest rate on these reserves by, by effect, by changing the quantity. If we supply more reserves, then fewer banks are in this position of needing to borrow them. And, uh, uh, and the interest rate, uh, the demand for them goes down, the interest rate tends to go, uh, down. The interest rate goes up if the supply of reserves is, is, is reduced. And that's the fundamental way in normal times that the Fed would affect policy. Banks, in their normal course of business, will tend to need to borrow from each other at times. And uh, the Fed makes that either cheaper or, or more expensive. John, can I just ask a really dumb question? If I want to borrow money from you, I don't have to go over there and depend on her interest rate. I mean, why? Why is there a federal funds rate? Like, if I want to borrow money from you and you're charging me 3% interest, why do I have an arbitrary 1% interest rate? Why can't? Who, are you a bank or yeah, are you I'm a, a bank, you're a bank. 
Yeah, you can. And what the federal funds rate is, is uh, the Fed doesn't set that. It's a market interest rate. It's the rate which on that day, banks are choosing to uh, lend to each other at. But you it, said it, the Fed can lower that rate. And, and it can lower that rate by supplying more reserves and then more banks will have them and, uh, and not as many will need to borrow. Everybody knows what that target is, so why would I sell you funds very different from that? If I know that the target is 1%, uh, it tends to anchor everything because everybody, it's, it, it's, it, it drives expectations about all of the money market rates. So he's not willing to loan to you if, that, if he's got to charge less than, if he's going to yeah, get less so than. And let's impact the supply reserves as well. So, so yeah, talk so, about how so what the Fed, so, uh, so there's a supply of reserves in the banking system and they're sloshing around trying to get to the banks that need them. Think of it that way. Uh, if, that, if that supply is smaller, then banks that want reserves are, uh, like anything, if, if the supply is smaller, the, the price tends to be higher. When we're talking about borrowing, a higher price is a higher interest rate. That's the price you pay to borrow some funds. So fundamentally, what the, what the Fed is doing is uh, altering the supply of reserves, uh, and, it, and it makes it, uh, then the, the folks who want it, uh, uh, because the supply is smaller, uh, the, the, the price of borrowing those tends, tends to be higher. But it's the, the reason that the FOMC is called the Open Market Committee is it's an open market rate. It's the rate that banks are choosing freely to, to borrow and lend from each other uh, at. And uh, now what, what Jim was saying was that the, you know, the underlying mechanics are something about the uh, supply of reserves. Um, uh, once that target is set, uh, uh, it turns out that banks pretty much know that, that uh, that's the rate that things are going to trade at. So, it tend, so the federal funds rate tends to, even though it's a free choice between banks, it tends to be near the, 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 the target for the reasons that, uh, that, that, uh, that Jim was explaining. So banks hew pretty closely to that target? Well, you know, it, it, it's it's that they, it's economically sensible for them to hew close to the target because if the rate uh, goes to five percent, why would you borrow at five percent? Because you, you know, know the, the Fed is going to take you steps. You go to the window and get the funds. The, 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 the Fed is going to take steps. There's 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 two ways. You know that the Fed is going to take steps to cause that rate to go back down. So you think, oh my They're gosh, changing the supply reserves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the yeah. so they so the Fed can either lend directly to you. At that uh, rate, uh, that uh, or at, that at discount rate, at, at, and the, at a discount, the, yeah, the rate at which, which is the Fed lends is a slightly, slightly, rate. Slightly. which is slightly very close to the federal funds rate uh, target in general, uh, above or below. So, uh, well, it's we can ask rate. if 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 folks are going to borrow from each other at all. Let's say the Fed was willing to lend at a rate down here. Would would banks? Lend, would anybody uh, borrow money at a higher rate? No, because no, they go to the Fed, Fed so, it's, so it's above. Just a bit. The, I think the key to understanding it is that basically the Fed is saying how much money there is. It's not. And I Fed. hate hearing that well, called money, but, so, yeah. but it's reserves, uh, it's bank reserves. Yeah, yeah, we'll get so, it. But we're abstracting from a whole lot of stuff in the middle. So in, individual banks are lending between each other. But the, the Fed's influencing the quantity of, of stuff reserves, they have to lend. Stuff they have available to it's lend. Like, it's like music like chairs. So it's how many chairs, the Fed determines how many chairs there are for this right. musical chairs game. Uh, and if there's less chairs, people are getting willing to pay exactly. more for them. Right. The key no. to understanding it is oranges. You know, the Fed controls the supply of oranges. If there's a law that says. It has a monopoly. You have, you, yeah, it has a monopoly on oranges. If there's a law that says every bank has to have oranges on hand when needed, then you, at the end of the day, don't have the oranges that you need, you got to go get some. Go get so what, that's like a 3% reserve rate or what? what well, it, but, no. but, but required reserves aren't, uh, aren't, uh, aren't, necessarily the, aren't necessarily the story, but, but uh, there is a reserve requirement on deposits, a certain share of deposits. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. determines how many oranges so, you need. So yeah. what I, so I, I'd be happy to go any which way uh, in this discussion. Um, but uh, there's, uh, we could stop at the story that the Fed supplies, this, uh, decides the amount of oranges, and if there's less oranges or less chairs in the musical chairs game, people pay more for them. Uh, they're more in demand and people pay more for them. So that means the federal funds rate is, is, is higher. Uh, that's the overall story. The actual mechanics of, uh, of, of how it happens and 
Uh, now there's lots of ways that banks can borrow reserves from the Fed, and we could get into lots of details, and it may, it may not, it's probably not worth the time right now because we have other, uh, other, uh, other good topics, but I'd be happy to uh, talk about this, uh, you know, at length some other time. Okay. Uh, so the Fed controls the supply of reserves, and, and that, in doing so, in so doing, either can push the federal funds rate uh, up or down. And that uh, indirectly affects all other interest rates and all asset prices in the economy. And so, uh, uh, so raising the federal funds rate target tends to make financial conditions less favorable to borrowing and spending, as you might guess. Interest rates go up. We call that less accommodative. Lowering the target makes conditions uh, more accommodative. And that's that policy in, in normal times in very, at a very general level. Uh, uh, so more accommodative policies tend to promote greater employment and promote push inflation upward, which you would do if inflation is below the target. Less accommodative mm. policies do the opposite. So what I want to say about this interest rate tool and all tools of the Fed can be very powerful, as you've probably read in the newspaper, very blunt, and it's very indirect. Uh, how does it affect uh, employment? Well, we change uh, an overnight interest rate between banks. Somehow that affects all of their interest rates and the stock market and things like that. So people decide to buy or invest more in the economy. Uh, so firms decide to invest more. Maybe folks decide to buy more cars and that increases demand. And so uh, auto companies hire more, more folks to build cars. Uh, so, it's, so it's blunt. Uh, we can just kind of nudge things in one direction or the other. And indirect, it works through a wide array of channels. Um, uh, so, uh, so let me uh, uh, so let me say one thing. Uh, right now, notice that our tool pushes both employment and inflation in the same direction, both up or both down. And you might ask, what happens if you want one to go one way and one to go the other way? Uh, and the answer there is, uh, don't have a tool to do that. So, right now, both sides of the mandate call for accommodative policy. Inflation is below the goal, uh, so. Uh, all else equal, uh, one would like to push it up toward the goal. Employment is below the sustainable level and would like to push that up as well. Uh, very oftentimes, the two sides of the mandate call for the same policy, but not always. So uh, uh, the statement of goals and strategy says when the two conflict, uh, the FOMC is going to get both things back to where they ought to be, uh, but it'll take a balanced approach trading off one against another. That's not the situation right now, so I won't go into more detail there. So I want to, uh, we already did the mechanics. What I wanted to uh, say is what's different now, and this will, yeah, this is going to lead right into Jim. Uh, so the U.S. had a financial crisis, deep recession, high unemployment, falling inflation. It's concerned about the possibility of deflation. Uh, the normal response would be to lower the federal funds rate target. Uh, uh, that makes policy more accommodative and tends to help push inflation back up and employment back up. But uh, you can only go so far. You can only push an interest rate about to zero. Uh, this rate that banks, uh, this ba this rate that banks uh, charge to lend to each other, because if the interest rate's below zero, it means I'm paying you to take the loan from me. Uh, and I can always just keep the money myself and not bother, uh, and so I'm not going to like a, a negative interest rate in that context. Uh, you'd rather just keep the funds. So you can't do the normal thing, and that's why we're currently doing uh, unconventional policy. Uh, uh, and there's two elements of unconventional policy that Jim's going to talk about. One is forward guidance, and that's our tagline for uh, talking about how long, so the federal funds rate is currently at, at zero and can't go any lower. Uh, the target is, uh, is near zero, can't go lower. And so forward guidance is promises about how long the interest rate will be kept at zero. So how long we promise to, uh, to continue to be accommodative, uh, uh, it's always so long as conditions uh, warrant, etc. That's forward guidance. And the second tool is large-scale purchases of longer-term securities. Uh, and I'm going to say one word about that and then be done. Uh, where, let's see, where, forward guidance, forward guidance, forward guidance. Uh, um, 
So as I said before, usually the FOMC affects longer term interest rates indirectly. They lower this overnight interest rate and that tends to cause all other interest rates to go down as well. Uh, uh, but instead the FOMC can attempt to affect longer term interest rates directly and thereby affect the economy. And how would you do that? Well, one way to do that would be to go out and just and purchase a large amount of uh, say 10 year bonds, longer term bonds. Uh, purchase a large amount of longer term bonds. Uh, if you go out and buy a whole bunch of something, uh, it tends to push its price up. Uh, and with bonds, when the price goes up, the implied interest rate or the uh, being charged is, is going down. So that lowers long term interest rates just by a direct effect of buying a lot of the stuff. Uh, so that tends to push down the interest rates on the bonds, and that's what the, the Fed has been doing. Now, sometimes this is characterized as uh, pumping up the money supply or, or something like that, and Jim's going to talk a lot about why that's probably not the way to think about it. Uh, note that the Fed isn't buying things in the sense, of, uh, 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 in the sense that you would think if, if you're either going to save money or, or, or buy something. Uh, this is more like saving because the, buy, the Fed is buying interest-bearing securities. It's being paid interest. That interest is being paid back to the Treasury. Uh, so you could think of the Fed as investing in these 10-year securities uh, in a way that pushes down their, uh, their interest rate. Okay. The last thing I want to say is just this. Over time, as conditions warrant, everybody would love to get back to that other world of normal policy.